Hey Credit Warriors, Credit Shiffle here, and on this show, in addition to covering credit cards, we often like to cover a variety of financial topics, and you may have heard in the news that the US and Mexico just signed a, I guess it's a declaration of intent to uh, seal a trade deal uh, on some terms that they have agreed, and so this is part of the renegotiation of NAFTA. Right now, the US and Mexico have just agreed a deal between them, and uh, President Trump has said he's willing to exclude Canada um, <laughs> if they don't come to the table and just do a deal with Mexico. And the Mexicans have said that, yeah, they're willing to do that too, which has sent Canada scurrying to come back to the negotiation table uh, with their foreign minister coming, I think, uh, today, cutting short a trip to Europe. And uh, she's uh, on her way to the US, to Washington, to come and, uh, and negotiate <laughs> on a trade deal because uh, Trump has threatened to uh, hit them with tariffs. So anyway, let's have a look at the what is currently being called the US-Mexico trade deal and we'll talk about some of the key factors and how it's going to improve, um, well, how the government says that it will improve uh, the US economy. So first of all, uh, we have textiles, which is an area that not that many media have talked about, but there are some agreements on textiles, basically talking about increasing the use of uh, North American produced fabrics. In addition to that, um, items such as threads or elastics that are used as parts of garments have to be produced in North America for the whole garment to qualify uh, for tariff benefits, okay, for trade benefits, tariff-free access, I guess, to the market to, you know, be transported between US and Mexico. So basically that's guarding against, you know, you make a shirt in Mexico, right, or you make a shirt in America, but you buy these cheap elastic for the uh, zip, you know, the, the hood or for zips or, you know, linings of zips, threads, you buy that cheap from some other third world country. Basically, they want more of that stuff to be produced in North America, either in Mexico or in the US. Now let's go on to autos, which really is the part which is most important. That's what most media um, are focusing on. And, you know, reviving the auto industry has obviously been one of Trump's campaign promises. So I'm sure that he's uh, holding that as a very important part. So basically for autos, they have increased the percentage of a car uh, of its dollar amount, okay? So it's worked out with the value of the car. So the percentage of the value of the car that has to be made in North America, in Mexico or in the US, for it to qualify for, um, you know, trade benefits, basically. And they've increased that from 62.5% up to 75%. So basically, more of the components of a car have to be made in North America. You can't go and buy so many cheap components from you know China, ship them over and put them into a car. Well, you can only do that with 25% as opposed to 37.5%, uh, I think it was uh, before. In addition, 40 to 45% of the vehicle must be made with labor that's paid $16 an hour or more. Now this to me definitely looks like more beneficial to the US because obviously wages in the US are higher than they are in Mexico. So either, if you want to make cars in Mexico, you're going to have to pay people higher wages um, or you're going to have to make those cars in the US or at least make certain components of those cars in the US where I'm sure people are working on manufacturing lines. It's a reasonably skilled job, so I'm sure most of them are getting more than $16 uh, per hour in the US. And the government certainly thinks that this will um, increase the competitiveness between the US and Mexico because, well, if you have to pay Mexican workers $16 an hour to you know, make those portions of the vehicle. You might as well just make it in the US anyway, uh, where people are getting paid those similar wages. And, you know, chances are you'll get better quality production if you do it in the US as well, because there's no language barrier, the country's just more developed, etc. So definitely this wage portion of it looks like it's gonna benefit the US a lot. Next, we'll talk about intellectual property and copyright laws, and not many media have talked about this, but it basically represents updating NAFTA for the digital age. So let's have a look at what's in there. So the government is saying that for the first time, all of these points are in the trade agreement. I'll just read them off. Enforcement authorities must be able to stop goods that are suspected from being pirated or counterfeited at all areas of entry or exit. Enforcement against counterfeits and piracy occurring on commercial scale. Meaningful criminal procedures and penalties for camcordering of movies civil and criminal penalties for satellite and cable signal theft, broad protection against trade secret theft, including against state-owned enterprises. Now this is pretty significant. Uh, there's a broad range of measures in there, 
Uh, you can see perhaps the movie industry has been doing a bit of lobbying. You got that th phrase about the uh, camcordering of movies, um, stopping pirated content at all entry and exits. Uh, then you've also got theft of intellectual property, including by state-owned enterprises. Uh, now, I think personally, although this probably is a problem in Mexico, I think this is serving more as a blueprint for a future trade deal with China, because theft of intellectual property in China is one of the biggest issues that is costing billions of billions of dollars a year uh, for the US economy. If you don't know, basically in China, you can't be a majority shareholder in your own business if a company goes into China, US company. You have to go into partnership with a local Chinese company, and generally they have to earn, own more of the business than you do, and they end up, because they have access to the whole factory and, all, and everything, a lot of the time they end up stealing your intellectual property and in the future going on to sell that and you get other companies then making products very similar to your own. Um, there is a huge host of counterfeit stuff. I mean, the iPhone has been copied many, many times. It says iPhone. It has the Apple logo on it. But as those of you who read Chinese can see, it's not an iPhone. It's the best iPhone 7 Plus knockoff. You see, this isn't a brand. Their motto is, we're the leader in high-quality iPhone and Samsung knockoffs. And they nailed it, right down to the iPhone 7's missing headphone jack, making this knockoff just as terrible as the original. I mean, no headphone jack? What were they thinking? Apple can't really do anything about it. They can't really sue because, you know, they'll never win in a Chinese court, so they just maintain the status quo. The Range Rover has been copied by a Chinese company. It looks very, very similar to the Range Rover. Um, and so there's a whole host of problems with that. And it's costing the US, not just the US, obviously uh, Range Rover is a British car owned by an Indian parent company now. So it's costing other companies, uh, other countries' companies, a lot of money too. So I'm thinking that probably seeing a successful deal go through with Mexico with these terms uh, is going to be sort of a big boost for the US's case against China on these kinds of things. And I just want to delve into this a little bit more. It not only covers, um, you know, commercial sort of copyright theft as in movies, songs and stuff. It also covers patents owned by companies, designs, other forms of intellectual property. There's also a clause for takedowns, so basically for internet service providers, so that you cannot host illegal content or copyrighted, you know, copyright infringing content on a server in Mexico and then broadcast that back to the US on the internet. Etc. So it is a huge update for the digital age. All right, now let's go into talking about agriculture. Uh, the US and Mexico are going to maintain zero tariffs on agricultural products, but there's also a variety of measures aimed at making agricultural trade, including biotechnology trade, um, more smooth. So there's increased cooperation on biotechnology, including genetically modified crops, which is something I don't really support. I hate genetically modified stuff. I hate people messing with my food, you know, splicing the genes. I prefer natural, uh, organic, you know, ingredients. You know what I mean? Okay, rant over. Um, there are also some other measures um, aimed at respecting the country's distinctive products, okay, each country's distinctive products. For example, um, Mexico is going to respect the names of US cheeses. That's very important. Um, I th I'm sure it is important for some, um, although it sounds funny, right? Uh, there's also another uh, section where they are going to respect uh, Tennessee whiskey and bourbon whiskey as distinctive products of the US and tequila and mezcal as uh, distinctive products of Mexico, okay? So basically, what I assume this is, it's kind of similar to the name like for Champagne in France, like other sparkling wines, they can't use the name Champagne because they're not from the Champagne region. So it keeps Champagne distinctive as a product of France. I think this, to me, this seems like the same thing as basically Tennessee whiskey or bourbon. You know, some Mexican manufacturer can't just make bourbon. Uh, it has to be imported from the US. Um, so it's kind of protecting each country's distinctive products. I think that's definitely uh, very good. Now this deal is going to have a 16 year time frame and it's going to be renewed every six years. So the idea is uh, you have a renewal every six years and then after that there is a 10 year period where if you don't like it, it, you're out in 10 years, it's going to end. So at the moment, like we said, it is only the US and Mexico that are you know, in talks for this deal and have agreed in principle on these terms. Uh, but Canada probably will be joining it, I think. They're, foreign minister is uh, coming to the US today to start negotiations. And, you know, I think by Trump saying, hey, um, 
you know, Canada will just do it with Mexico if Canada's not interested. Uh, he cited 300% tariffs on certain U.S. dairy products and said, hey, you know, if Canada doesn't want to be in the deal, we'll just hit them with auto tariffs on their vehicles. Um, often Trump does this as a negotiating tactic. It's actually, you know, written in the art of the deal, basically this tactic. If you want to know what he's all about, you can just read his book. It's that easy. Um, but he negotiates, you know, he starts a very extreme position and then negotiates back to something that the other side thinks is more reasonable, but it's actually what he originally wanted anyway. Um, so, you know, saying he's going to do it with Mexico, I think probably um, it will go down with Mexico and Canada. I think it'll be easier to get through Congress because right now Congress have only given approval for renegotiating uh, NAFTA. You know, these trade deals have to go through Congress. And there are many like congressmen and senators who don't really support doing it just with Mexico, or, you know, two separate deals. Um, so I think it'll definitely be easier to get it through with all three and probably Canada risking being hit with tariffs and seeing that Mexico has already kind of fallen and uh, given in and wants to do a deal. Canada will probably come along quite quickly. That is my opinion on it. Anyway, guys, what do you think about this trade deal? I think it's definitely great for the US auto industry. Uh, and there are some other interesting things in there, some interesting updates with the IP as well. Uh, please leave your comments below. Tell me what you think. And we will see you tomorrow with a video about credit cards.